On the next episode of World in America, we meet the Norwegian Americans. First, we visit the Scarborough Sharves as they keep the Norwegian language and the culture alive. Later, we'll taste the signature meals of Norway, the delicious gravlak, and the cloudberry duck. Then we'll move uptown to Central Park and listen to the Hardanger fiddle and do the Telespringer dance. It's all coming up on the next World in America. Norwegians are very independent people. It's an independent culture. They're very hardworking, honest, pragmatic. Norwegians go på tur. They go for a walk on Sundays. Uh, actually, you get bad conscience if you don't. Norwegian culture is very strong. You know if you're talking to a Norwegian. They are upfront about being both Norwegian and American, and proud of that fact. Norway is in the north of, of Europe on the Scandinavian peninsula. We border Russia and Finland and Sweden. We have a coastline all the way from the south to the north. The mountains are beautiful, the sea is beautiful. It's a, it's a stunning, rugged geography. Norway is a very small country. It, today the population is four and a half million. From the 8th century till the 12th, maybe, different Viking kings were uh, becoming friends and unified Norway into one country. Then Denmark came and, and occupied us for 400 years until we had our first constitution in 1814 and became a democratic um, kingdom. Uh, but then Sweden came after that and occupied us till 1905. So Norway is actually a quite young nation. The history of migration from Norway to America is a long one spanning across four centuries. They have a record of more than 100 Norwegians here already in the 1600s. The very first Norwegians who came to America were sailors, uh, carpenters who worked on Dutch uh, boats. The first organized uh, wave of migration to the U.S. was in 1820s. The Norwegians who left then were mostly from the western coast of Norway. They belonged to specific religious uh, groups um, and they were given the possibility of establishing their own societies. Meet the Scarborough Sharves. This couple originally hails from Norway and England, but Norwegianess is central to them and their children. My name is Bonnie Scarborough, and I live um, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan near Columbia University. I was born and raised in Norway. I've been married for 13 years. I have two kids aged seven and nine, two girls. My name is Caleb Scharf, and uh, I'm originally from England. Um, I'm a scientist, I work at Columbia University. My specialty is in astronomy. It was not in London or Oslo, but in Washington, D.C., where they met and fell in love. This made the United States a natural home for the Scarborough Sharfs. We met in Washington, D.C. 
about 15 years ago. One of the things that we had in common was this thread of another country in our lives. We had three wedding ceremonies, one in Montauk, um, where I wore a traditional Norwegian costume called a bunad, and we um, had our American friends there. And we traveled to England, and um, where my mother is, and that part of my family, and other friends, common to both of us. So we had a ceremony there. And then we had a ceremony in Norway, and for both of us, I think that was very important to, to show that all these three groups of people were, were very important to us and a big part of our identities. For Bonnie, her homeland is still very fresh in her memory. When she closes her eyes, she can still smell the fragrant Norwegian roses of her ancestral home. Both my parents are Norwegian. When um, they married and my sister was born, when she was six weeks old, then they came to the United States. We moved back to Norway for a few years and back to the U.S. for a few years. And when I was six and my sister was seven, my dad came home with, with the tickets and said, nope, oh, going back to the United States. took cruise ships from Norway to the U.S. My mother tells the story of, of, you know, we'd been on the boat for a few hours and, and uh, my sister and I looking at her and saying, where's, where's Tante Bogni? Where's our Aunt Bogni? For someone from Norway coming to the U.S., as I see not just in, in Bonnie, my wife, but in her family, it's, it's a real, it can be a wrenching thing. One of the ways I coped, and, and my sister as well, was by thinking that, well, you know, at some point we'd, we'd go back to Norway, someday we'll go back to Norway, and back to my aunts and uncles and cousins that we missed so much when we left. And I think I, you know, we managed to, I managed to keep that dream or illusion alive for myself until, until I had my kids. And um, it was when we were applying for kindergarten for my oldest daughter, Lila, that that it really came home to me that, that no, we're not going to go back. They're not going to grow up Norwegian. They're going to grow up American. And, and it kind of came home to me that, that that move my father made so many years ago was now, was now impacting the next generation. The next generation was going to be born in the U.S., go to school in the U.S., and probably feel more American than, than Norwegian. As she yearns for her homeland, one refuge for Bonnie is her collection of family folk art that she adores and deems very precious. Some of the wooden carved pieces, I have a round box and I have two square boxes, two rectangular boxes. These were made by my great-grandfather and when I look at them I, I feel a tremendous sense of pride um, because sometimes in the U.S. when I felt kind of lost and when I felt like I wasn't anybody then I could look at those things and I could say, but, you know, I come from this, I come from this long tradition, I come from this tradition of farmers, people who are hardworking, who work the earth, who are from this place, connected to this place. And, and so when I look at the, those things, then that's what, that's what they give me, that sense of belonging and pride in my, my background and my heritage. In order to transmit her culture, Bonnie has registered her daughter to a Norwegian class. On top of it, she also reads to them regularly in Norwegian. My eldest daughter, Lila, is using an online um, teaching service based in Norway, where she sits with Bonnie, her mother, and they go through a number of reading and, and speaking exercises, and it actually records the way she pronounces things. So she makes small recordings, she then submits them online, and a real tutor 
in the next few days in Norway looks at those and listens to that recording and gives her feedback. Nihete program it's nice because it's quite structured and she has a certain number of words that she learns, words or phrases that she learns each week. Du ser på TV. Du ser på TV. Du ser på TV. It's almost like having a small classroom experience in Norwegian. We have quite a collection of, of Norwegian children's books that, that we've bought over the years and I read them in Norwegian and I often translate the story into English. As Bonnie sings along with Layla, she hopes this is a fun activity that will help her daughter in the long run. Sometimes Bonnie will, will try to sing with them and go through the lyrics with them. I'm hoping that it also connects them to the culture. These are typical Norwegian children's songs, so perhaps when they're in Norway, they may hear a reference to that song, um, and then they'll know what it is. They, they won't, it won't be a mystery to them what that reference is. They'll know what it is. The best of Norwegian cuisine and all of its Scandinavian elements are made available to all the hungry bellies at the Smorgas Chef, which also boasts a unique interior design. The Smorgas Chef was essentially founded six years ago. I created the, the, the lamps out of uh, blue water bottles. I used knife and forks for, for the ceiling lamps that creates this cast of shadow onto the ceiling. Although I have modern Scandinavian elements within the design, I keep it uh, sort of a little bit classic as well. The first dish we'll check out is also the most traditional, the gravlok, which is cured salmon at its finest. The first step is that we take the uh, caraway seeds the peppers, the juniper berries, and the corianders, the salt and the sugar, and we mix it all together in one, one bowl. You gently mix this so you distribute the, the herbs, the spices. And then we take a little bit of the burnt off aquavit that we had earlier, just dab your hands in it, and rub the salmon gently with it on all sides. It's a critical step. Then you try to distribute this as, as nicely as you can on the salmon. Gravlax is really one of our key dishes and uh, it's one of the dishes that carries the longest history from, uh, from Norway. So this is uh, fresh dill chopped and you distribute it nicely and you need quite a lot of, of uh, dill. Gravlax actually means buried salmon. That's what it means specifically. And uh, today we have the refrigerator, so we cure it in the fridge. But back then they would uh, put on the spices and they would put it in the ground for, for uh, three or four days to let it cure there. After about six hours or two and a half days, the, the Gravlax will look approximately like this. It has uh, the dill, the coriander, the juniper berries. All of these now have blended in and replaced the liquid of the salmon itself. So now it's a finished cured product, but you cannot serve it with all these herbs on it, so you need to carefully take the excess herbs off. So you slice a thin slice of the salmon, and you'll see that you have some green dill on one side, here, 
and the other side is bright orange and almost translucent. That's what uh, ensures you that this is a safe product. It's completely cured. Uh, it's uh, unlike what many people think. It's not a raw product. It's a cured product. Another mouth-watering dish is the cloudberry duck. Here, Chef Morton makes sure to add that Scandinavian touch to the duck. The first step is to take the duck and score the skin side of the duck lightly with the knife. We have a, a mixture of fresh ground pepper and kosher salt. And then, carefully, with the duck side, with the skin side down. The pan has to be exceptionally hot. This is going to take three to five minutes to make sure that you burn off all the fat within the skin and you get a crisp uh, brown surface of the duck. Then you'll see that you have the, the scoring here and, and it's essentially sort of burned out all the fat that's in the skin. Here. Okay, so now you've got the right kind of surface. Now you're going to put it in the grill for about 10 minutes and let it finish off. In the meantime, we're going to prepare the uh, carrot ginger mash, which is fresh carrots, cloves of ginger, and you got uh, honey. I got the carrot ginger mash, which when it's done, will turn into this kind of consistency. While that is cooking, you have a red cabbage that has been reduced with raisins and other spices, and it creates a, a side uh, dish to the duck. There we go. And now it's time for plating. First goes down the carrot ginger mash. The second side to plate is the red cabbage raisin reduction. And the centerpiece of the plate is the medium rare duck. Chef Morton tenderly slices it and then places it next to the mash and the reduction. Most importantly, it's the special cloudberry sauce which gives the duck its Norwegian edge. The cloudberry sauce is a sweet reduction of the cloudberry which you find in Scandinavia. It's, it's an orange berry. Uh, it's the most expensive berry that uh, exists on earth. It has a little bit of a sort of a, a little bit of an orangey kind of flavor to it. Uh, apricot slash orange slash mango has a little bit of all of these flavors in it. So that's the, uh, the dish. <laughs> The cuisine I know the best is the one from Scandinavia and from Norway. And I figured since I'm from there, even though I don't have the you know, professional background in, uh, in culinary skills, I obtained that later. The most important skill you need is to know what the food is going to taste like. And then, uh, and then you can cook from there. Scandinavia House is the place to be to check out some contemporary art from Norway and beyond. Scandinavia House has only been open for about eight and a half years now, but the American Scandinavian Foundation has been around for almost a hundred years. Northern Latitudes is an exhibition of five Norwegian artists and four American contemporary artists. The interesting thing about this exhibition is that there are really a lot of different styles and, and techniques used. From oil painting to video to very technical work to poster and book arts. In this exhibition we have three pieces that are flickering uh, very rapidly. They're kind of hard to look at for very long. They challenge the, 
the viewer and the perception a bit um, and they also have a resonance throughout the room. A lot of times people that are third, fourth, even fifth, you know, many generations apart have a, a very nostalgic view of um, the Nordic region. And so we want to be able to connect them with contemporary Scandinavian culture, not only what they read about the Vikings and the, the history. So this, these kinds of exhibitions are really important. Once a year, Central Park, New York becomes a hub celebrating everything Norwegian. The event is called Norwegian Festival or Norway Fest, some uh, refer to it as that. Uh, it's been going on for 15 years now and um, it's a gathering of Americans and Norwegians together. It is such a great event for kids. We have a lot of events for kids, which is very important to us, you know, to, to reach the uh, to New York kids. Even if we're American-born, we can give something to the people of New York by showing what we know about Norwegian traditions. It's great because I get to dance for an audience, for uh, get, to, get to show some, something to people from the Norwegian side that they've probably never seen before. The dance we did where there are three of us who are doing improvised steps is called Telespringar, the Springar from Telemark. Maybe you heard about Telemark skiing, so there's a little influence about these steps and movements in there. Even some of the people that are from Norway might not know about this dancing, and then now suddenly they can come to New York and see, 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 see Norwegian folk dancing and hear the Hardinger fella. The Norwegian Americans not only appreciate how the United States embraces a multitude of cultures, but they also utilize it to the fullest to cherish their traditions and share it with others through their cuisine, modern and folk art, and finally adding a Nordic spice to the global mix called the Americana.